I want to start with a, a strong statement, but I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think it's an unreasonably strong one. We've seen this week that a lot of people have a lot of strong opinions about a lot of things, and uh, one of them is, you know, <clears throat> that a lot of mathematicians have clear ideas about which proofs are beautiful and which proofs are not. And you might think that when you move from paper to the computer, um, we throw that all out the window, that we have decided that we're going to embrace you know, function over form, and uh, we're really going to you know, move to a, to a world in, in which you know, what, what matters is getting the proof done. What, what we care about is, is checking the correctness or not and leaving it there. And I think that we've seen already this week that <clears throat> that's not the case. I mean, people who work in informal proof, you know, communities of people who write formal proofs together, you know, have very clear ideas of what good style is, uh, informal proofs. And uh, I think we saw also from Patrick's talk that, uh, that the, the, this, this clear idea of what it means to have good style in formal proof could be something that lifts and, and gets, uh, gets uh, exposed to the rest of the world as something that is interacted with for people who are not native speakers of the, the formal languages in question. So yes, I mean, I think there is indeed a, a well-defined notion of a beautiful or, or not beautiful formal proof. And what I want to try to do in this talk is to, to try to discuss that, to try to think about what it means to write a, a nice formal proof or a not nice one, what questions of style arise. Um, and I mean, I think there's a lot to say. Um, uh, so I myself, for three years now, have been formalizing proofs. Um, and I've written in that time thousands and thousands of lines of lean code. And also for two years now, I have been a, one of the maintainers of the, the lean mathematical library MathLib, which now has a million lines of code. And in that time, I've reviewed even more thousands of lines of other people's lean code, you know, and, you know, some of it I felt was really beautiful and some of it I, I haven't. And my, my job has been to, to make sure it fits with the rest of the library and to, um, to assess you know, whether there are improvements that can be made. Um, I should say I'm not the only maintainer in this room of the Lean Mathematical Library. So Patrick, Gabriel, Anne, and Adam who left are, are also maintainers and there are you know, 23 of us in total. So I want to talk in, in this talk about what good or idiomatic style is in formal mathematics. And I want to make the caveat that this has to be a highly subjective talk. Uh, I have to you know, be clear that I'm, I'm speaking for myself only and my own opinions. Um, and uh, I also want to say that <clears throat> I'm going to be focusing on, on what I think of as good style in formal mathematics in places where that differs from what good style is in regular mathematics. I think that <clears throat> almost all principles for writing good mathematics on paper extend to the, the corresponding principles um, in, in formal mathematics, and so this is really a question about where there are differences and why those differences are interesting. So I want to talk about differences <clears throat> in two main areas, and the first of those areas is the question of how to integrate computation. Um, we've already seen two really beautiful talks on computation and formal proof so far. We've seen the talks of Anne and the talk of Asiya, and so, the first thing I think to say is that some proofs are obviously computational. I mean, there are the famous proofs, you know, the four color th theorem, the, the Kepler conjecture, the ternary Goldbach, um, you know, something that you might toss to a SAT solver like the, the Keller conjecture, um, it, you know, verified numerics proofs like the existence of the Lorentz attractor, you know, if somebody writes a paper and they compute all the 92 invariants of the uh, binary nonic, that's also, you know, necessarily a computational paper. And I think that, that nobody will object in mathematics to the use of computation in obviously computational proofs like that. Um, but, um, I mean, you could also say, you know, to, to put a straw man out there, like if, if I want to make my straw man a 1970s computer scientist, that, you know, perhaps all proofs could be computed really. You know, we're going to solve mathematics with amazing SMT solvers that are going to fi find all theorems for us and uh, we'll know exactly what proofs are correct and which ones won't. Um, and that's a computation too. And uh, we've reduced all proofs to computations um, and everything is done. Okay, so this is a straw man. And I think it's clear that most people, you know, have, have seen the problem with the straw man, which is that, 
you know, uh, we do mathematics for the understanding and, and uh, a huge resolution uh, proof is, is not giving us very much understanding. Um, but I think there's a second and more subtle straw man, which is the straw man I'm going to call the, the 2010s mathematician. I think the 2010s mathematician straw man is the following. It's the idea that the computation we want, um, the automation we want in mathematics is precisely the automation that mimics the patterns of human thought. That what we want to get to eventually with formal mathematics is a formalization that follows beat by beat the thought that the human involved had. And that the task that awaits us is to, I mean, in, in the words of someone else at this conference, to make the easy things easy, to uncover the hidden structure or the hidden patterns that, that humans might have been using um, without ever formally codifying them. And, uh, and once we uncover those patterns, you know, we'll have a, a perfect union of the, uh, the formal and the informal. So I think this is also a straw man. Um, the point I want to make in the first half of my talk is that um, I think that there's such a thing as a good proof that nonetheless is not exactly the proof that a human would have thought of. So I'm going to give a few examples, um, I think, to help us arrive at those principles. So this is a fairly concrete mathematical problem. So it's a little lemma that arises when you're classifying the wallpaper groups. It says if we have a triple of natural numbers um, and the sum of their reciprocals is one, then we have you know, the following three cases. Um, and I want to run through a couple of, of proofs of this. So incidentally, this is how you get this nice classification of some of the wallpaper groups. So these are the, the wallpaper groups that, you know, you know, lead to this, this tripartite classification, you know, with basically three families of uh, three, uh, I guess, uh, or orbit types of, of, of non-trivial uh, fixed points by the group, you know. So in this one on the left, you know, there are three sort of centers of symmetry, each with 180 degree rota rotations at them. In the one in the middle, there's, um, you know, one center of symmetry with 180 degree rotations and two centers with 90 degree rotations and in the, the one on the right, you know, the, the situation follows. So, it, I mean, it doesn't matter exactly where this lemma comes from. Suffice it to say that, you know, when you're classifying the 17 wallpaper groups, there are many cases to consider and this lemma is one of those cases. Here's a paper proof that I lifted from a textbook. Um, so it says, okay, well, one over P plus one over Q plus one over R is one. Um, so the mean of those three reciprocals is therefore one third, and we do a case split. So either they're all equal to the mean, or else the smallest one has reciprocal less, uh, greater than that mean, and that forces it to be one half. And then we do a further case split, and uh, you know eventually we we get there to the answer. You know with those three cases that I wrote down. So this is taken by a book um, of Conway and two collaborators on symmetry. I want to now describe um, a little lean proof that I wrote with Anne in the audience um, you know, yesterday, 15 lines long. And I don't think it's fundamentally different, but I think that the places in which it's different are slightly interesting. So this is meant to be a somehow fairly literal translation of what our lean proof was doing. It was running an algorithm that you would really say is, is overkill on, on paper in order to uh, to get some initial inequalities. So this Fourier Motzkin elimination is something that we've got ready to go in lean, and you know, it derives all the things that you can derive from systems of linear inequalities to get other systems of linear inequalities. And um, it, you know, it looks longer uh, on this page than it does in lean because I mean, we, we've got things you know, set up so that you know, there's a, a special word that, that means do Fourier Motzkin elimination. Um, and uh, I, I guess also um, the, I, I've also made a point somehow of, of stating here the things you get to along the way in a way that you don't necessarily have to in a lean proof where you have the goal state, state keeping track for you of the place you've reached, reached at each point. But so there's this first kind of algorithmic uh, step where we invoke this standard algorithm uh, for a Motzkin elimination that, uh, that gets us um, a couple of crucial inequalities. So the one, the, the lower bound for one over P and upper and lower bounds for one over Q. And then we have a little bit of thinking. So in order to upgrade the inequality uh, one over Q less than one half to one, one, over two, one over Q less than or equal to one third, 
So this is uh, a tiny bit of custom automation that Anne wrote for me yesterday. Um, and then we run the big linear, uh, linear inequality automation again to get a further bound. And the key point is that uh, I've organized this proof in such a way that I front load the, reduction, the, the proof that, that, that uh, there's only finitely many cases to check. So I've gotten as efficiently as I can to upper bounds for PQ and R, knowing that once I get to upper bounds for PQ and R, I can toss it off to a, a very generic kind of automation to just check the, the finitely the many remaining cases. So I think the pr difference between this proof and the paper proof is that the paper proof has somehow more more branch points, more, more human endpoints, more, more places where the human has an idea. Um, it, there is a conscious choice on the part of the humans writing this proof to prune the somehow search space at each step. And the, this pruning is, is done by a, um, by a slightly inefficient um, uh, case division where you do a little bit of case division and then a little bit of thinking and then a little bit of case division and then a little bit more th thinking and this process iterates. So on the computer, it, it can be switched. It, the, the, these two modes of thinking can be fully partitioned into initially all the thinking and then later all of the case division. And it's okay that the number of cases to check in the end is larger than it would be. So I'm going to show my hand and say, I think this is just as good a proof. I, I don't think the fact that this doesn't fully follow human thought patterns makes it a bad proof. In some sense, I think that perhaps it's even easier to follow this proof because, for example, I've made a point of specifying at the time I, I do my inequalities that, that these really are inequalities where you have all the information if you want to run a standard algorithm. Um, the way that the humans have written this proof in the, in the first version you need to do a little bit of thinking at each inequality stage to, um, to assess whether there is some special input about the natural numbers or whether, um, wh whether it's simply a standard algorithm being run. And so I, I claim that you know, having a fixed number of moves, you know, these, these different algorithms that you combine in different ways, can actually make it easier for someone to reproduce the thinking you were doing. Um, and I just wanted to mention, I mean, the, the wallpaper group classification is somewhat niche, but uh, there's a very similar proof, which I think is really core to a lot of mathematics, which is the uh, classification of triples with 1 over p plus 1 over q plus 1 over r greater than 1. So that's the ADE classification. And uh, I chose to discuss this one just because I think it's, it's slight, slightly harder and therefore slightly more interesting as an example. Okay, I want to talk about a second example, which is... Uh, similar in spirit, but I think a little bit um, more larger in scale and, and therefore a better illustration of some of the same points. So this is a theorem from physics whose somehow, you know, true physical meaning I can't claim to know, but which reduces to the following statement about Boolean functions on the reals. So there doesn't exist a way of, of saying, you know, yes or no, red or green to, to the, the real number, the, 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 the points in R3. Um, it's such that for any triple of non-zero mutually orthogonal vectors, um, you know, if you take the values of your function at those three points in the triple, you get zero, one, and one. So this is a theorem from the 1960s uh, by Koshin and Specker. And uh, I'm going to be talking about um, an improvement of their argument uh, made in the 90s by Perez, which um, it, uh, takes the approach of saying, okay, well, to prove this is impossible as a function from R3 to 0, 1, it's enough to show that it's impossible as a function from a certain set of 33 uh, vectors in R3 to 0, 1. So this is a finite case, case check sort of already. Like, I mean, it, it, it is a finite case check proof, and I think the, the difference in style between the human version and the formalized version is uh, in how the case checking is approaching. So... Here's the proof from the, the paper in the 90s. And you can see that it exhibits some of the same patterns we were seeing with the human proof um, of the, uh, the wallpaper classification. So it makes a clever sort of, a, a clever uh, walk forward through the search space, making sure to only introduce a little bit of new information at a time. You know, making sure to introduce a little bit of new information by considering one more specially chosen triple, 
and then after that to get all of the information you can from that triple before making one more case split and getting all the information you can. And there's, I mean, an art to choosing the precise sequence somehow of which triples are going to be assessed one by one from, from the set, and also an art to, to, to sort of uh, explaining as efficiently as possible you know, how you can rule out some of the cases that arise at each step. I want to compare this with a formal proof written by, uh, by uh, John Harrison in, in 2005 in Hall Light, um, which is really quite short as a piece of, of computer code. It's 120 lines. And it really is a brute force search. And I want to claim that in the case of a, a brute force search, um, it, there's somehow nothing wrong with it. Like the, the clever part of this proof already was coming up with the witness of 33 points. And if you've been clever enough to come up with the, the right witness, I mean, the idea is there. Why should you be forced to, to explain in detail why that witness works? Um, you could say that, you know, perhaps if you explain your witness clearly enough, you, you can explain to, to the reader, you know, how they could have come up with this, this witness themselves. But I think that you could, you know, respond to, to that, that counter argument with the counter counter argument that perhaps, you know, explaining to somebody why a mathematical uh, idea turns out to work is kind of like trying to explain a joke, like, you know, um, or, like, or, or, a piece, or a piece of art. Like, you know, you might say, okay, well, the meaning of this idea, the meaning of this witness and why it works is the following. And somebody might say, no, 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 that's not, that's not the idea. You know, my proof uses the same witness, but when I saw that witness, um, you know, my interpretation of how you would have invented that or come up with it is completely different. I think that, you know, forcing the proof that a particular witness uh, is indeed going to, to check out, you know, it doesn't, so that, you know, that, that doesn't need to be um, required as part of the argument. And, you know, if you leave it out, like you, you almost leave the room for, for interpretation um, on the people that uh, might be looking at it and thinking about it. Okay, so one more proof, uh, one, one more example um, with ideas of computation. So this is a different kind of computation. Um, so this is an example from Lean's Mathematical Library, um, and it's the multiplication formula for the Chebyshev polynomials. So there's this sequence of polynomials called the Chebyshev polynomials. They satisfy this uh, two-step recurrence relation. Um, so the polynomials are in some variable x, but I'm going to drop the x for efficiency and just refer to them by their t and their index. And there's this multiplication formula saying that, you know, for all m and k, 2 tm tk m plus k is equal to 2 t sub m plus k plus 2 plus tk. Um, so to prove, I mean, and I've drawn a picture of the cosine graph because it, you, you might know that the, the Chebyshev polynomials uh, encapsulate a, a property of, of the, the powers of the cosine function. Um, so any proof of this that doesn't, you know, invoke cosine, which is one, one approach, any, any, any purely algebraic proof of this, is going to be an induction. And the induction that works is something like, you know, first prove it for m equals, you know, 0 and 1 for all k, and then prove it for m equals 2 for all k, and then prove it for n equals 3 for all k, and so on and so on. So a, a, a clever choice of, of induction over the two variables. And I want to compare a paper proof, um, again, with what I think is the idiomatic formalized proof. So I think this is how we have been trained to write formal proofs of this kind of thing. You have some sort of calculation that starts with the left-hand side of what you want, finishes with the right-hand side of what you want, and then the poor person who really wants to you know, investigate why this is true sort of reads through step by step and subs in the expected thing at the expected point and really convinces themselves line by line that it works. So, so this is how we present proofs of equalities in mathematics papers by and large. It's by allow, so, presenting, so reducing it to a sequence of steps, any one of which the motivated reader is able to check. So I think that you know, we should get out of the habit of doing this. Like, let me present an alternative proof, which I think is just as good a proof, and which doesn't require as much work from the reader. So it, this is a proof that I formalized, and the proof is there is enough information to make this work. So write down the inductive hypothesis in a couple of places, write down the recurrence relation in three places, 
and then uh, toss it to a Grobner basis algorithm. And I promise you, like, you know, the thing that has to be true is true. Like, I, I, think, I think this proof is just as good. Um, I, I think that, you know, if you are the human and you have the idea of taking the thing that must be true and pinning, di pinning it down in enough places, you know, providing enough information that, that res the result you want is forced, you know, why should you be then forcing your, your readers to, to check it through line by line? And so the reason I think that we traditionally have presented proofs in this way, where we make our readers check it line by line, is that there's always been this gap between the paper version and the digital version. So if you have the paper version, it will take a lot of work for your reader to, to manually enter in symbolic variables for each of the different Chebyshev polynomials appearing in this induction. You know, type them in as, as five you know, separate uh, polynomials and then type the goal as a six, sixth polynomial. All of them in, I, I don't know how many variables I have, probably six or seven different variables. And then to, to send that to a computer algebra system, and then to take the result of what the computer algebra system gave me, and if I need to translate that back into regular mathematics. So the, the barrier is very high to doing this kind of algorithmic computation when you're working on paper. And so I think there are a lot of mid-sized computations that you know, would be perfectly good as, you know, there are a lot of mid-sized computations that on paper we do do by hand because the barrier of switching them to a computer is too high, that we don't need to do by hand when we write them up formally. And so I think the, the point at which we switch to full automation is lower in formalized proof and should be lower. I think, yes? For the purpose of this Grobner basis computation, do you temporarily assume the t's are variables? That's right. So this is a Grobner basis computation um, so where the t's are variables and uh, I think the x is also just a variable. Yep. Yeah, every individual t is a variable. Well, and I also lied slightly because there is one step where if you have t's where the indices represent the same, the same natural number, but the indices are not definitionally the same natural number, but rather only propositionally the same natural number, you know, they're not recognized as, as the same variables. So there is a first normalization step where you, if we can find a couple of examples, maybe, maybe uh, this one and this one, if I'm looking correctly, where the indices are the same, but it requires a little bit of work to show that the indices are the same. There's a preliminary normalization step where you, you normalize the indices to make that transparent. And Heather, how, how did you find these polynomials? Was it just trial and error? How did I find it? Well, what I did was I, I went to the, uh, the paper proof and I looked at all the things that were used in the paper proof. And I knew that that would be enough to send to the Robner basis algorithm. I should say also, so many, uh, many, uh, many languages, uh, many, for many formalization languages do have this ability to send a computation to the Grobner basis algorithm. I think Harrison already had this in Hall like 20 years ago. It certainly exists in Isabel. I think it exists in Koch. And it's existed in Lean um, with the help of an external call to Sage since last year. Um, this is something written by uh, Rob Lewis and two of his students. And it's a really nice piece of automation. Um, I missed it before we had it, and now that we have it, I'm glad we do. Um, so yeah, I think the point I want to make in conclusion with computation is that we've always, as human mathematicians, had the ability to send proofs out to some standard algorithm, but the, the point at which we do that has become much lower when everything is already available in an electronic form, or at least it should be lower. That, that's, my, that's my statement, that we don't need to restrict ourselves to doing computations with the things where even a human would agree that, that you need to, to send that out to a computer. We can, we can lower our threshold a bit and make more proofs, purely computational proofs. Can I ask you, so imagine, so in this case you had the proof. Uh -huh. But imagine that you're trying to write a lever that you don't know. Mm -hmm. Are you advocating we kind of expand as much as possible, apply Grobner tactic and kind of cross our fingers? And you, when it works, we go, okay, great. You could do that, right? Like, I mean, there's an art here of coming up with the, you know, the two instantiations of the inductive hypothesis and the three applications of the occurrence relation. But I don't think this, this came completely out of nowhere, right? Like, I mean, as I was saying, you know, in my case, I did just look at the paper proof and see which ones were relevant. But there's also an art to looking at the indices and trying to find, like, I think the, the inductive hypothesis instantiations are, yes, but then, 
uh, you know, it, if, if you if you want to then look for recurrence relation values where the same indices turn up, like I think you could argue there there is a mathematical art there to come up with the right instantiations. And the nice thing is that with the automation, you always know if you have enough instantiations. Like you know, it's just you know you've got a, a one one second check that you've got enough hypotheses out there or not. And uh, you know, if not, you can add more and try again. Like yeah. The question of whether or not to do this is very context dependent. I mean, so there are times when, when a calculation is the point of a paper, that, that, that some interesting um, uh, computation is happening, which you want to draw the reader's attention to because you might want to replicate it uh, or, or generalize it or something. And in other cases, it's very routine, and you're proving something that, that is very standard. And, and in those cases, it, it makes sense to, to have this more, uh, to outsource the computation to, to, to a tool and, and just focus on the inputs and outputs. I, I think I agree. I, I think there's also a question of what routine means. Like, I think that something that is, is work that is being done by the formalized mathematics community at the moment is the question of when we think of something as routine, what does it mean? You know, what is the, what is the algorithm in our heads that's making it routine? And, and so, like, exposing that routineness um, is something that, uh, that takes uh, some, some thought. Uh, yes? Yeah. So, um, so you're saying that uh, like a tactic, like synth or something, you can't figure out that it needs to just apply inductive hypothesis or the recurrence relation a certain amount of times in a certain order. It doesn't. It, it doesn't. If you, if I say simp, like inductive hypothesis recurrence relation, it won't like. Well, so the Grobner, like the Grobner, the basis algorithm is going to require a finite number of inputs. So you have to select which finite number of hypothesis instantiations of the hypothesis to run the algorithm on. So, um, it, you know, the, the, the automation simp that you're referring to can indeed, like, apply an individual lemma to, to prove an individual goal without needing to know which particular in index it's being instantiated at. But in order to, to make it a computation that you can run according to an algorithm, you need to pick in advance the indices. <coughs> and this is the part where I think there's... So you're that. saying that it's the Grubner basis tactic or whatever that requires you to choose. Mm -hmm. The simplifier won't be able to do the arithmetic, right? Do you mean the Grubner basis calculation? No, no, the simplifier also wouldn't be able to do sort of adding three to both sides. Adding the three to both sides. What yeah, do you mean? I'm sorry, I doubt that the simplifier, if you gave just the simplifier those equations there and asked it to prove that out. Oh, no, I don't think it would. I, I don't think it would have a catch. That's about right. Mm -hmm. I should, yeah. Alternatively, you could get the Grubner basis algorithm to show you how to write the desired result in terms of the generators of the ideal and present that equation. Yeah, I mean, and this is in fact this is in fact precisely what is done. In <laughs> so, in in some in some languages. Um, it, the Grobner basis algorithm just says yes or no, but in Lean, the Grobner basis algorithm presents pr the witness in precisely the form you're describing and says, you know, here is how it works. You take, you know, x copies of the first equation and three copies of the second equation. Um, I mean, I, I can show it to you later if you like, but it, it really does give the witness in exactly that form. So that's what it looks like, Patrick? Yes, sir. After Polyrith says, do you use linear combination, blah, 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 mm -hmm. then some parser says, the way you see this is it's 38 t squared times the first one. And this is not yet but you could, I, think, I mean, I think that you could, could, be, yes. you could also algorithmically generate something like this, I think. Like, I think it would be pretty easy to get a Grobner basis algorithm to output, you know, a sequence of uses of just one of the hypotheses, you know, line by line, so that a human could check it if they wanted to. Um, but I'm not sure that you would gain anything by it. Um, so we can return to this in the questions, but I want to turn now to the, the second place I wanted to identify where uh, this, this, there's a sort of stylistic difference between what I think is appropriate on paper and what I think is appropriate in formal mathematics. So this is the question of abstraction. And the first thing I want to say here is that, you know, obviously, Bourbaki won, like, you know, everyone, <laughs> <laughs> everyone at this point, you know, is in principle, in, in the favor of writing everything in exactly the right context, you know, with exactly the, the appropriate, you know, generalization for everything and doing everything, you know, exactly as it should be. So everyone, I think, is, you know, agrees with this idea in principle, but where you find people objecting to it in practice is, you know, if you're writing along a perfectly good mathematical proof 
And then you're like, aha, well, this is a, a simple lemma from the theory of decorated wombats. Like, your, your readers are not going to be so, so happy at you, you know, jumping in and invoking your, your simple lemma from the, the theory of decorated wombats. Like, this is not going to get you points from your readers. And, uh, you know, you're perhaps going to be forced to, to reorganize your proof. Um, so I think maybe the, the short version is, you know, standard abstractions are, are universally accepted and, and what is a standard abstraction can vary from field to field. And people will also accept an abstraction if in the context of that particular proof it already makes a really clear improvement. But the cost you have to pay is that probably you have to, you know, make a digression yourself and include like a, a section on preliminaries where you explain, you know, for the purposes of this paper, for the reader who may not be familiar with your particular abstraction, what this is and how to use it. So the really nice thing about formal mathematics, which is also, I mean, uh, also somehow a dangerous thing, is that you know, you're tied to foundations. Like, you know, when you write a piece of formalized, formalized mathematics, it's depending on, on hundreds of thousands of lines written by other people. And every single prerequisite that you want to, to, to use is available in some very fixed form already. I mean, so we've heard a lot about, you know, why this can be dangerous. How, you know, if you want to, you know, to, to change a, a foundation a little bit, you know, uh, everything that follows from it has to be potentially rewritten. How if you want to, to take a piece of knowledge that's well known in one formalized language and move it to a, to a different one, you've got a lot of work ahead of you in, in transporting everything it depends on. How there's dangers for interoperability, you know, dangers for you know, durability of proofs. I mean, and these are all very valid concerns. But I think we've heard a little bit less about the flip side, which is how, you know, how great it can be to have all the foundations you might want for everything available at your fingertips. It really makes it possible to live that dream of writing everything in ex exactly the abstraction you want to. And this can be, you know, I think quite, quite empowering. So I want to give a couple of examples of, of proofs where, in my opinion, the right abstraction is obscure enough that, that somebody on paper would never have written it with that abstraction, but where it becomes natural to do so in formal, formal mathematics. I'm not advocating that we should do this on paper, what I'm saying is that I think this is the place where good style differs on paper from good style in formal mathematics. And given that this is available to us in formal mathematics, I think it's a style we should be following there. So the first example I want to mention is uh, so the Lax-Milgram theorem. So this is a theorem saying if you have a real Hilbert space and a bilinear form on it, um, and the form is bounded, and it's also coercive, which means that when evaluated um, twice, you know, with two inputs of the same vector, um, it, that's bounded below by, you know, beta times the, the norm of that vector squared. So this is, you know, one of the workhorse lemmas in the theory of elliptic partial differential equations. Um, and so, okay, so I told you the setup. I didn't tell you the conclusion, which is that any element of the dual of the Hilbert space um, it can be uh, expressed as the bilinear form evaluated at some vector for a particular vector. Um, so the proof starts in the same way, you know, whether you're doing it formally or informally. Um, it, you use the duality of a, you know, the isomorphism of a Hilbert space with its dual to um, make an associated boundary linear map, which sends, you know, which turns your H, H cross H to R into a map from H to itself. So this is the first step in both cases. And so here's uh, the paper proof that the person who formalized this in Lean was following. So, I mean, I, 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 I think this is a perfectly fine proof for its context. It's uh, saying, okay, well, the, the next, you know, th this is only a part of the proof. This is like a snippet from the broader proof. It's going to, it's the step where we establish that this map A, which is a, an endomorphism, an operator on the Hilbert space is injective and has closed range. And the proof is something like we use coercivity to give um, a lower bound on the norm of the operator for any vector. So that's uh, the, the norm of, of of AU is greater than or equal to, to beta, the coercivity constant, uh, times the norm of U. And then we uh, get the injectivity immediately from that, and we also get the closeness by looking at, you know, the little things going close together and using this, this lemma to relate how close they are in the image with how close they were in the original space. So there's nothing wrong with this proof. It's how I think you would naturally write it on paper, but 
you know, it so happens that, you know, if you want, you can say, aha, this is a simple lemma from the theory of anti Lipschitz maps. And in MATLAB, it's perfectly natural to invoke that simple lemma from the theory of anti Lipschitz maps, which actually was already there because somebody else had written the theory of anti Lipschitz maps for a, a, different, um, a different project two years earlier. So uh, Dan Daniel Gonzalez, who is a PhD student at Karlsruhe, um, formalized this proof um, in, uh, in Lean, and he was able to say, okay, well, the first step is the same. We have this lower bound. Um, the norm of AU is greater than or equal to beta times the norm of U. And this immediately gives the anti-Lipschitzness anti -Lipschitzness of the map in question. Anti-Lipschitz meaning that, you know, it's a, it's a metric space notion that if you have the distance between f of a and f of b, this is greater than or equal to some constant times the different distance between a, a and b. Um, and there was some lemma already giving exactly the proof that we were looking at here, these, these two steps of the argument, but in this greater generality of anti-Lipschitz maps. And so, you know, it's this capability of looking at a proof like this, and on paper you might say to yourself as you wrote it, you know what, like I clearly don't seem to be using the Hilbert space structure while I do this, like probably if I wanted to I could extract a lemma which didn't mention Hilbert spaces. But you wouldn't do it. And by contrast, in formal mathematics, um, not only can you do it because everything is so closely tied to everything else and available instantly by cross-referencing, but also things are a little bit painful and, and so you're really heavily incentivized to, to reuse this work if you can. So again, I want to say I think this is an example where there's, you know, each proof is a perfectly good proof for its own medium, but, um, but because of the difference in mediums, the, the, each proof is the correct proof for its medium. Yes? So is this something where when you're formalizing this proof, you know that you want to use anti-Lipschitz maps beforehand? Or is this something where you say library search and then... I don't think, it's, I don't think it's either because, you know, library search won't, ma won't work. Library search will, will only work if you know in, already that you want a lemma about anti-Lipschitz maps. I think what we're talking about here is the thought process where on paper you might have, you know, felt like a kind of... You know, you know, feeling in your stomach as you looked at, at some part of the argument that, you know, we don't really seem to be using very much about the broader context of the problem here, that this could be extracted out. And on paper, you might get as far as actually extracting that out and, like, inventing for yourself the theory of anti-Lipschitz maps. Like, it's not a particularly deep theory. Um, but, you know, you might, might or might, it might or might not occur to you that somebody, you know, had, had written up this theory. You wouldn't quite know where to look because I'm sure this theory has been, you know, the, this theory of, like, probably three latex pages has been developed in, in independently in many books before, perhaps under many names. Um, but I think in, in, you know, when you're working in formal mathematics, you would at least get as far as seeing that there was the generalization. And then you might get as far as asking your friends in, in the community if, if they knew of this particular abstraction somewhere in the library. And at this stage, you know, the scale is still small enough that, you know, probably the person um, who can tell you that we already have that, and it's called the theory of anti-Lipschitz maps. That, that person will be there and able to tell you that. Yes? Uh, so to elaborate on, on your, your reason why you wouldn't do this on paper is, mm -hmm. is you know, the reader has no idea what an anti-Lipschitz map is. You'd have to take a whole bunch of extra definitions. What is a metric space? It's right, like, yeah, it's clearly unworkable. So, yeah. I mean, what this paper proof is, is effectively is you've taken the standard proof from the theory of anti-Lipschitz maps and compiled it out in this setting, you know, mm -hmm. substituting this example for the general theory. Can you do that with the formalized proof as well? Can you take this formalized proof of, you know, and ask Lean to print, essentially, the theorem about anti-Lipschitz maps specialized to this setting? Well, that's an interesting question. Because that's sort of the expository choice you're making as an author of the paper proof. It's an interesting question, although I would say that part of the reason you do it on the paper proof is that you can't expect your reader to be confident in the application of this theory of anti-Lipschitz maps that they've never seen before. And so, um, and so it's courteous to your reader to specialize it. In Lean, they can trust you that, you know, this is a place where that theory is applicable in a way that, you know, they, they can check you, they, they, they can believe you when you say, we have all the preconditions for that theory to apply. But I think it's more than that. It's also mm -hmm. the cost of having learn all these new definitions just to read the proof, and if there were some way to sort of specialize by substituting the familiar definitions for the more general ones. It's a good question. Um, we, we might have, I mean, I don't know, Patrick, you, it sounds like you have a thought. I, I, I'm I mean, actually not in, sure if... In that is, example, it should be 
possible, but there are clearly cases where it would be harder. I mean, when we when the more abstract version is really more abstract. I mean, in that case, I mean, saying we have a theorem about metric spaces and we can just replace distance between x and y by norm of x minus y everywhere, then then it's very easy to do this translation. But but actually, uh, so for that particular case, this is how it works. But many lemmas that you would expect to see proven for norm space or metric spaces, in math there are actually lemmas about uniform spaces. And, and this, in this case, you cannot simply just replace symbols. Uh, it's just a right. genuinely more abstract uh, notion and, and more general. And, uh, mm -hmm. so. I would just like to add that from a CS perspective, this is what you're saying. I think it's a program synthesis problem. You want to have like a different language, a higher level language, <coughs> speed, to give the same argument. So you have to synthesize this new argument. It's much, much harder than just to Hmm. I think it's a very, very hard computation problem. There are solutions for this, right? But they are all bad. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's interesting to explore. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, just to give a concrete example, suppose you want to interchange two sums, obviously mm -hmm. non-negative real numbers, OK? You could appeal to Fubini's theorem. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a one-line proof. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but if you expand that, you have to set up all the measure theory. We had a whole talk about, about that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and actually, it's, it's, it actually has the danger of being actually circular, actually, because, because uh, one, one of the, I think at some point, uh, somewhere in the bowels of measure theory, is um, you know, there's some lever that you can yes. interchange some. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I mean, it, it, it works from a formal viewpoint, but it, possibly from uh, um, a, a conceptual viewpoint, it may not be optimal. I would like to argue that your example is different from my example, but I think it will take me a little bit of time to draw the distinction. Um, I feel like maybe the difference between your example and my example is that in my example, like the argument that I gave, that the person was giving on paper, is exactly the same argument that, uh, that uh, is then being abstracted out. Whereas in your case, um, you're applying a theorem, but the proof of that theorem you know, although it would special, you know, may, maybe it would specialize down to a lemma about finite sums, like certainly has a lot more going into it. So perhaps it's a matter of really what I'm, I'm perhaps saying that this style is particularly natural when the argument itself is, is secretly already in, in the framework in question. Okay, I want to mention one more example. And so uh, this is uh, an example from the theory of smooth vector bundles. Um, in Lean, which is uh, ongoing work of mine with uh, Flores van Doren at Orsay. So let me, uh, to orient you, give the definition of smooth vector bundle that, uh, that we've made. So we've said it's you know, a smooth vector bundle with fiber F over a smooth Banach fold B, consists of a disjoint union of topological vector spaces over top of V, together with topology on that, and trivializations, and the, the property that the transition functions um, for those trivializations are smooth. So, Maybe I've lost half my audience. I, I think that's okay. I, I don't think that the particular um, definitions matter here. But, but this is, I mean, for reasons that we can discuss perhaps later, if people are curious, like the, the choice we've made for the definition of smooth vector bundle um, in Lean. And so when you make it the definition in this way, you then have a theorem rather than something that's given for free that a smooth vector bundle is a smooth manifold. So I want to talk about how you would prove this. And in this case, the paper proof that I'm going to give is kind of an invented one because I didn't find somebody in the literature who started with precisely the same definition as we had of smooth vector bundle. And so what I'm, you know, writing down here is how I imagine someone would try to prove it on paper. And, you know, it's not particularly hard. You say, okay, well, you know, this B is modeled on uh, some bonic space H and we've got uh, charts, uh, you know, also, so we've got trivializations for the vector bundle, and we've also got charts um, for the base. And we can put these together to define a candidate chart for the, the, whole, the total space of the vector bundle as a smooth manifold. And so this gives you a large family of candidate charts. And the task for the, 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 the person who wants to, to make this theory is to prove that the transition functions between these things are smooth. And why is that the case? Well, if you look at these big transition functions that I cooked up, they're made up of some smaller things which definitely are smooth, namely the transition functions um, 
for the, uh, the trivializations together with the, uh, the charts for the original base of the manifold. And I want to compare this with some version of what Flores and I have written um, in Lean. So it's a little long, I've split it across two slides, but we're using a pre-existing abstraction from the library, so the, the abstraction of this, the structure group weight, uh, a, a structure group weight for a, a, a way in which a, a space is modeled on another space. So you say something like, you've got this base, which is a smooth manifold, and that is modeled on some bonic space H, and then the vector bundle over that you know, then gives you a sequence where the vector bundle is modeled on the base cross the fiber, and then that base cross the fiber itself is modeled on the, the model space of the base cross the fiber. So we've got this, this composition going on where we've got a sequence of things each modeled on the next. So now the charts for um, E with respect to H cross F come up by this idea of composing the charts for the first modeling with the charts for the second modeling. And also, um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so I think that's all I've written so far, that when you have you know, a sequence of thing, spaces each modeled by, by charts on the previous one, you can compose these all together. And this is an abstraction that exists, so that the idea that you can compose charts from a sequence of modelings in this way to, to get charts for the, the whole sequence. And then there's another sort of abstract theorem about how you can compose um, the transition function properties along, the, along such a sequence. So, you know, the fact that we know that um, in the first thing in my sequence, um, vector bundle E is modeled on B cross F with the somehow smooth fiber-wise linear structure group weight as well as the B cross F being modeled on H cross F by the, the usual group weight for smooth manifolds. Um, it, the, these two properties of the appropriate transition functions can be composed in some way to get the property you need for, for the composed, composed charts and the composed transition functions. And anyway, out of this abstract theory falls the result that you want. Um, so again, this is a case where I don't think that anyone would ever write it on paper in this way um, if, uh, if they sort of were not really trying to be Bourbaki, but, you know, in, in Lean it's rather natural. I mean, it has the uh, advantage that it gives you small, many more small things to check. So working with a very large object like this in lean is very painful, especially given that all of these are partially defined functions. Charts are only defined on parts of a manifold. Trivializations are only defined on parts of a vector bundle. Um, and so dividing up the, the tasks into smaller tasks in this way turns out to be convenient as a practical matter, um, as well as the idea that you can extract out parts of this argument, like the, the composition of charts and the composition of structure group weight properties. Um, in a way that, that doesn't depend on any particular features of, of, uh, of differentiability or, or smoothness. So this is depending on the, the very beautiful theory of structure group points written by Sebastian Guizel. And again, it, it's a nice feature of the argument that you know, a lot of the abstractions needed were already there. Someone had written them for other reasons. And so you have the ability to reuse abstractions in this way. So those were the two main points I wanted to cover in this talk. And I think I just want to close with some pointers to other questions which I think are in equally interesting but which I haven't had time to discuss at all. Because this is a workshop on machine-assisted proof, um, I made the conscious choice to only discuss in this talk the question of, given a fixed statement, um, what constitutes a good proof, formal or informal, of a fixed statement. But there's an equally interesting question which probably is harder, I think, um, when you're doing formal mathematics, which is the question of how you design the theory, how you s select the statements that you're going to prove, and in what order, um, and uh, you know, with, what, uh, with what helper lemmas and what automation. Um, so uh, there's a lot to say here. Um, I'm not going to say anything except to say that other people have thought about this and written about this, and I want to mention a couple of really beautiful papers which uh, examine this question in concrete settings. Uh, firstly, a, a theory about sort of a, a paper about the theory of uniting um, 
you know, a, a hierarchy of abstractions in algebra and a hierarchy of abstractions in topology. This is a paper by a bunch of people working in clock, including Asiya. And secondly, a really nice paper about the change of variables formula uh, for integrals written by Sebastian Guzel um, in the context of Lean, which talks about a lot of design decisions in the math of library for Lean. Um, so that's all. Thank you for listening.